You're listening to The Thrive Podcast, where every week we dive into a practical, tactical tip to bring you from a life of simply surviving to thriving. It's personal development for the everyday girl who is done with coasting through her days, done with feeling like she's missing out on the deeper meaning of her own life, and done with mediocrity once and for all. Because it's not enough to simply survive, you deserve to thrive. Hey friend, let's talk about friends today, shall we? Obviously, having great girlfriends can be really key in truly thriving in life, but also obviously, long gone are the schoolgirl days of making friends over swapping Lunchables in the cafeteria or friendship bracelets at recess. Because honey, we've got our big girl pants on now, and whether they're in the form of a pantsuit or scrubs, sweatpants or mom jeans, chances are they feel a lot less forgiving than back in the day. Some folks might just immediately write off the idea of needing new friends past age 22, but it's not as practical a concept to maintain when the real world happens. We graduate, we move, we get married, we move again, and suddenly we're in the middle of nowhere with our husband and three cats, working from home and seeing only your elderly male neighbor at 2 p.m. every day at the mailbox. It's all fine and dandy. Heck, you're married to your best friend, so that's not bad. But when it comes time for girls' night and you're a party of one, it doesn't feel so good. Also, my cat doesn't hold up her end of the deal and brings crappy snacks to the party, so I need someone who enjoys quality queso and margaritas on a Thursday night. (laughs) Suddenly we realize, We need to make friends as an adult. And then we gulp, and then also gulp said margarita. (laughs) It can be challenging to make friends as an adult for quite a few reasons, I think. Namely because we're not sure where, and we kind of sort of forget how. It feels more awkward than it did on the playground, and nowhere near as simple, right? There's just no way it can be easy, because adult life isn't always easy. So it's bound to get complicated and messy and weird and not worth it in the end, right? No, not right. (laughs) Not necessarily. Making friends as an adult doesn't need to feel like this totally intimidating vortex back into your fifth grade brain. Because let's face it, fifth grade sucked for everybody. In school, friendship had phases. First phase was just of convenience and closeness, because everyone conveniently went to the same school because they happened to live close by each other. Second phase was college, or any other secondary sort of step. And third phase, well, it's all choice, where you're in a more independent, totally in control phase, maybe in your early 20s, where what you do and where you eat and who you see and who you are is entirely a work in progress that you write as inspiration hits. Then there is a fourth phase that's back to convenience and closeness if or when you become a parent and become friends with your kids' friends' moms. So while these phases change with time and growing up, I think three keys stay the same. Key number one being mean girls grow up and they just get meaner. (laughs) That's a totally sad reality, but one I've learned myself firsthand, one my mom has learned. I mean, it just doesn't go away, as unfortunate as that might be. So the biggest way to combat the mean girls as an adult is to remember that they're not your girls. While you might have been stuck in their class as a kid or on their cheer squad as a teenager, you're not in their world anymore. You're not in their world and they're not your people, simple as that. Hurt people hurt people. So just remember that, pray for them, and find your people who you can love well and who will love you well in return. Key number two, give and ye shall receive. I really believe it is so, so important to put out what you hope to get back, but not because you hope to get something back from it. Does that make sense? Be the kind of friend you wish to have. Don't just wait around wishing and hoping and praying for the soul sister you never had to show up on your doorstep. If your love language is gifts and you love having girlfriends who always gift each other cute little things when they reconnect, are you gifting your girls now? If you really care about feeling heard and thought of and cared for randomly, 
Are you checking in with your girls now? Key number three, social media makes it complicated. So take it with a grain of salt. It's like basing a relationship on texting alone, but with the added confusion of seeing someone's pictures and videos and taking them for face value. You can feel like you know everything about a person's life because you very well might based on what they choose to share with the internet without actually knowing the person. Or you can trust that a newsfeed tells the truth when we all know that's definitely not the case all of the time. Screens can make the best hiding places. So really just keep that in the back of your brain when you're scrolling online as you navigate your grown up friends offline. I think what will be the most helpful here is to break it down into the where and the how. Where to make friends as an adult and then how to actually make it happen. So first things first, let's talk about the where. First, in the past. Say what? <laughs> okay, okay, hear me out. Normally I would say leave the past in the past permanently, but there is something to be said about revisiting any warm relationships that have just fallen off the radar because of life and not because of something specific. So first and foremost, consider running through your mental Rolodex of friendships and think of any connections that might be worth reconnecting with now. The second place is on the internet. So many of my best friends today are girls I met online, literally. This might be obvious since, hello, I work on the internet, but I have met so many amazing girls through blogging. <clears throat> Both in the forms of fellow bloggers and in folks who so kindly have chosen to follow me and my journey. It's a very easy way to make this very big world seem a little bit smaller. My advice for getting started here is to find like-minded people online, people who you think you'd get along with swimmingly based on what you see of them on the internet. Of course, the caveat here is not everything is as it seems. So many folks put up a pretense of who they want you to think they are online, which of course ain't cool. So I recommend focusing more so on what and how people actually write or how they present themselves in something more casual and instant, like Instagram stories, versus judging someone for their clever Instagram caption that might have taken a week to come up with, or their polished, finished YouTube video that was scripted and filmed by a pro. In being a blogger, it was easy to start commenting and reaching out and just building genuine connections with good girls. It's like speed dating in a way, since everything is already all laid out there online. If you do some digging, you end up knowing so much about someone even before that first outreach, so it's a lot less intimidating when you already know that a friendship may be a fit from the get-go. My girlfriends and I laugh now because so many of us got connected by literally reaching out to someone and saying, I like you, wanna be friends? <laughs> No worries if you're not a blogger though, you can still make awesome internet friends. Facebook groups can actually be great for finding some like-minded gals right off the bat. Actually, quite a few bloggers run their own Facebook groups for their readers and followers, so you can connect with others who have at least one thing in common already, reading the same blog. Others started from a blog but stemmed into way more than that, where the blogger isn't really moderating anything anymore, and it's more of a community-based free-for-all of all the things. Lauren Everts of The Skinny Confidential has her own group where girls share more personal or provocative thoughts. Lauren McBride of Lauren McBride Blog has a group exclusively for fellow mamas. And Grace Atwood of The Stripe has a group where many girls share things like book or podcast recommendations. So if you dig around and start with what you know, new friends may be closer than they feel. The third place to find friends is at work. Maybe it seems like a no-brainer, but get to know your office. I think that some folks might feel competitive or uncomfortable being too friendly with the folks at work but it can be a great space to get to know people on a deeper level, where appropriate, of course, and create good friendships, especially since y'all might be there for years together. Take the time to get to know your colleagues, especially those who work closest to you, both physically and metaphorically. 
Physically, it'll help having someone right by you to join for a quick coffee run. Metaphorically, it'll help having someone who's also friendly with you when you're otherwise working together or collaborating regularly. The fourth place to find friends is at after work activities. So if buddying up while on the clock feels uncomfortable, try signing up for after work activities or initiate them yourself if your own workplace isn't the proactive type just yet. Some employers are ahead of the game and organize things like group kickball or happy hours, but if they're not already doing so, don't be afraid to try and set something up for yourself. People crave connection. It's our human nature. Chances are, if others aren't already saying something, they're thinking something, and they'll be really grateful that you spoke up if you end up creating the opportunity for something fun on everyone's random Tuesday night. The fifth place to look for friends is at the gym, specifically at your favorite workout class or something that you'll be hitting up at least semi-regularly from here on out. You've already got the shared enjoyment of the activity, so if it's also a regular class, that's really great for expanding upon. Once you're class friends, that can turn into lunch after class together or shopping before. Also, what the heck is better than a buddy for working out? The friends that stay fit together, stay together. That's how that works, right? (laughs) The sixth place to find friends is at a bar or coffee shop. Many folks have used apps like Bumble BFF to find new local friends too. Disclaimer though here, I'm not the biggest fan. When we first moved, I downloaded the app because I was feeling super lonely having literally zero girlfriends in happy hour range from my house but I was finding that it was super hard to find actual kindred spirits on the app. I'm someone who really craves deep connections and similarity beyond a shared love of The Bachelor or Queso. Cause I mean, any girl in her right mind loves those things, right? (laughs) After feeling a bit discouraged in the app world, I decided I would just buck up and attempt what men notoriously pull on the regular at bars, to pick up a girl. (laughs) But I wanted to pick up a girlfriend, obviously. So I was actually out with Jamie and a group of girls about my age showed up and were right near us. So I just struck up random conversation with one while her friends were talking amongst themselves. And it turned out she was so insanely sweet and we had a lot in common. And now we're friends. How wild is that? I mean, it's not actually all that wild, but in today's digital day and age, The fact that I met someone in a bar and became legitimate friends with her just feels really freaking cool. In a setting like this though, it does take chutzpah to keep it going beyond surface level bar talk. So you've got to do the same as you would do picking up someone romantically, so to speak. You got to get their number. So it's important to have a good enough substantial conversation that by the end, it's not weird to ask to exchange numbers. Say you'd like to be friends, hang out and just go from there. All right, so now that we've covered a bit of whereabouts to make some new friends, let's run over how. First things first, be proactive. My mom always taught me growing up that if you're passing someone in the hallway, look their way and smile. No need to show teeth or be weirdly giddy to a total stranger. I mean, you don't wanna creep anyone out, but just be warm. You know how insanely isolating and cold it feels to walk by someone in a quasi-confined space, like a hallway or a grocery store aisle, look their way for some totally normal human eye contact and acknowledgement of existence, and nothing? They look straight ahead, coldly, refuse to note that you're even there, let alone that you're a fine and okay human being? (laughs) It stinks! So don't be afraid to be proactive and extend that olive branch of warmth and kindness. Next, be genuine. It seems like a duh statement, but I swear it's not because too often I meet people who completely miss the ball here. You have to be a friend to have a friend. We can't expect folks to just flock to us just because we think we're awesome. It doesn't work like that unless your last name starts with Karda and ends with Sheehan. It really takes a genuine commitment to being genuine. And part of being genuine means you should be just as supportive with good news as you are with bad. It's funny, in marriage, people think that with in good times and bad, the bad times are hardest. And oftentimes that might be true, but in friendships, 
I think sometimes the opposite ends up being harder for people, especially if any degree of jealousy or personal insecurity may be coming into play. I read this bit once in the book, The Myths of Happiness, and it said, the surprising finding is that the closest, most intimate, and most trusting relationships appear to be distinguished not by how the partners respond to each other's disappointments, losses, and reversals, but how they react to good news. Isn't that wild? Think about it. If you've got a friend who's there for you through the bad, that's great. But it might be easier for someone disingenuous to react correctly to bad news if they themselves are more of a bad news bear and weirdly thrive off of it. Sick, I know. But some folks just love drama. Honestly, ain't nobody got time for those folks. The true test of friendship strength is how genuinely someone reacts to good news. Are they truly excited for you? Is there any hint of jealousy? Will they really uplift and support and encourage you through it all? Or just when it's easy or convenient for them because they feel better or higher up than you in a moment? Think about that. Next in the realm of how to make friends is make the first move. Because hey, someone's gotta do it. Showing that fearlessness in making a first move opens up the door to conversation quicker and it makes the other person immediately more comfortable knowing that you likely won't reject their outreach if you're the one reaching out. Yes, it might make your own fear of rejection a bit more prevalent, but it might also help to think of rejection as a good thing if it means you're just weeding out the bad apple friends on the path to finding the best. Next, be vulnerable. If you're not there in good times and bad, you're not a genuine friend. But if you don't let people be there in good times and bad, you might not be a vulnerable one. We feel good when we feel needed and we trust others more when we entrust them with things. I heard this good gem in another book called Click, The Magic of Instant Connections. And it was talking about how allowing yourself to be vulnerable helps the other person to trust you because you're putting yourself in an emotional, psychological, or physical risk. Other people tend to react by being more open and vulnerable themselves. So the fact that you're both letting your guard down helps lay the groundwork for a faster, closer personal connection. Isn't that cool? Let your friends have the chance to be a better friend to you by opening up, sharing deeper feelings, and getting past surface level. Another important thing to keep in mind when you're trying to make better friends is knowing your time commitment. How often will you check in on the friendship? I've seen and personally had friendships come and go because of this and this alone. If one party is more committed than the other, it shows and it inevitably impacts the relationship. We all have a different friendship style and friendship love language with our own preferred communication styles to keep something going. Do you prefer texting daily to feel connected or are you cool with a FaceTime every two weeks to catch up? Do you need life moments to be shared instantly when they happen or can they wait until they're pooled together in one catch-up call? I know for me, I can do either of the former, but I prefer more regular connection to feel really connected to someone. And I definitely need bigger moments to be shared as they come. Otherwise, I feel like a random Facebook friend catching up on someone's life through a newsfeed, which is near meaningless to me. Once you know your time commitment, it's also okay to share that with your girlfriends and get on the same page with expectations. Expectations can kill friendships, romantic relationships, the whole nine yards if they're not addressed upfront and honestly. So always err on the side of open communication. Now, this next one is one of my personal favorite ways to make friends, and that's to ask for introductions. Networking is the most effective thing on the planet, I swear, and people actually love to be the connector. So if you want to make friends as an adult, just make friends with other people's friends. Do you know the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon? It's based on the Six Degrees of Separation theory that any two people on the planet are supposedly six or fewer acquaintance links apart. I think it's got its name initially because if you play it with Kevin Bacon, any Hollywood anyone can be connected to him. But chances are, literally, that you know someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows Beyonce. 
So ask your friends to introduce you to other cool people that they know that they think might vibe with you. I mean, if you've already got a good mutual friend, you'd probably all get along at least on some level or have something in common if you were all in a room together anyways, right? So it's a good way to A, meet new people, and B, meet new people who you probably have something in common with already if you share that mutual friend. Lastly here, if you're trying to make new friends, just say yes more often. I mean, I totally get it. Sometimes saying no is just easier and even better. But if you want to make friends now as an adult, you might need to step outside that comfort zone a bit more than you're currently accustomed to, especially since so much of adulthood can be regular and routine once you're going through your day-to-day -day in the working world. As kids, it's easier, not because it is easier necessarily, but because of the perspective that so much of life feels newer then. As an adult, we develop this been there, done that mentality and settle in, feeling more comfy where we're at and in our routines and less willing to extend the limb. But saying yes to something new could be that one last step to finding a fabulous friend or heck, your soulmate. Don't say I didn't tell ya. Wait, before you go, if you like what you just listened to, drop us five stars on iTunes. Make sure you're subscribed to never miss an episode of Thrive. And if you're on Instagram, snap a screenshot and share to your story with what episode you're tuning into and tag me at Erica Legenza with what part resonated with you the most. That way I can see what's helping you and your friends can pick up a helpful tidbit too. Thanks for tuning in. It's your time to thrive.